All right, we're going to get started. Hello and welcome to U.S. Rowing's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion monthly webinar. Today, our topic is how to create a diverse and inclusive collegiate rowing program. Uh, we're excited to present to you today to hopefully provide information uh, from different programs from around the USA. And uh, there will be a lengthy 20 minute uh, question and answer that you can talk directly to the panelists. Uh, so uh, just be patient with that. You can ask questions informally in the question and answer uh, forum. Uh, try to limit your back and forth chat because it can really annoy the heck out of me, the host, as well as other people who are trying to pay attention. If you need to directly uh, chat with someone, feel free to do that. Feel free to give them a shout out. Uh, and so welcome. And we're going to get started. My name is Richard Butler, and I am the co-chair of the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion uh, Committee for U.S. Rowing. I'm a, the former inclusion manager for U.S. Rowing. And I will pre-tell you that everything that comes out of my mouth today is Richard Butler's opinion, not U.S. Rowing's perspective or opinion. And so I'd like to begin by introducing the panelists who agreed to be here today. Uh, they, like you, are, are world changers and I'm just excited to hear what they have to say today. And so I'm going to start with how my uh, gallery is set up. So Carol, you're on my left hand side. So you're first and just introduce yourself. Uh, where do you row? Where do you coach? And uh, I'd like for you to answer this question. What is the essence of rowing? And for the audience, guess what? You get to respond to that exact same question in the chat. So what is the essence of rowing? Three, two, one, go in the chat and Carol, you're on. My name is Carol Schoeniger. I am the head rowing coach at Robert Morris University. So I'm entering my second season as the head coach and this will be my sixth year coaching at Robert Morris. Before that, I spent some time at Duquesne University and took a break in between to be an elementary school teacher. So I also coach at Three Rivers Rowing and I'm on the board there and coach master's athletes. So you're gonna get a lot of Pittsburgh representing today. So get excited for that. Um, the essence of rowing for me is liberation. Yeah, essence should be really small, right? So that's perfect. Thank you, Carl. I'm gonna go all the way to my right with Katie. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Katie Silla. I rode for the University of San Diego for five years. Um, I'm originally from San Francisco. So I rode at Pacific Rowing Club there for three years, came to USD, uh, did a fifth year because of COVID and now I'm still involved helping out the team. Um, I'm currently getting my master's at University of San Diego. So I just haven't left, it's too good to leave. Um, and for me, the essence of rowing, that's a hard one. Honestly, if I think about it, I think rowing is very similar to life. I feel like it's, I feel like rowing is very complicated and can be overcomplicated very easily, but in reality, it's a very simple thing that just takes hard work. And I feel like that applies to a lot of um, life lessons as well. Um, so I think what I get out of life is also what I get out of rowing. So that's the essence for me. That's actually beautiful. Thank you for that. Um, I'm still waiting for our participants to put in the chat what they think the essence of rowing is for them. So I'm moving over to my left again, and we have Dave. Hey everyone, my name is Dave Cormier. I am going into my third year as an assistant coach and the recruiting coordinator uh, for the University of San Diego. Um, I've been involved in the sport for about say, 13 years now. I started off as a uh, walk-on at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Um, for me, I would say the essence of rowing is clarity, meaning that, you know, when I first came into the sport and still true to this day, my job is very clear. Um, that's make my boat go faster than that boat. And I love it. Thank you for that, Dave. Kaylin, right in the middle on my screen. Hi, I'm Kaylin. I started rowing my freshman year of college at CMU. So I've been rowing for about four years now. I just graduated, so 
I'm kind of just like hopping around, like helping around through rivers and I'm hoping to help coach CMU next year. The essence of rowing for me, I would say is unity in the team because like I, since day one, the team has been what's kept me in the sport and like pulling for your teammates and just moving with your team. So that's what it is for me. Yes, thank you for that, Kayvon. Hugh, to my right. Hi, my name is Hugh Chun. Uh, I just graduated from CMU uh, this past May with Kaylin. Um, I've also been rowing for about four years. I started right when I um, came in for undergrad. Uh, I'm no longer rowing on a team, but I'm helping out with CMU as well as um, starting up our program uh, with Three Rivers there. Um, and for the essence of rowing for me, um, I would say is definitely community, both on the water and off the water. Um, there's a distinct and strong sense of community with both your team, your boat, um, just in every aspect of rowing. Thank you, Hugh. And the superstar, Amalia. Hello, my name is Amalia Rosa. I currently am in my senior year at Robert Morris University. Uh, I have been, I'm on the women's rowing team. Previously, I rowed at the nonprofit Philadelphia City Rowing in high school. And I'd say that the essence of rowing is very giving. Um, I remember my novice coach told me like, whatever you give um, to the sport you get in return. And I still believe that to be true to this day. Yes, thank you for that Amalia. And then the chat, we have things like team is the essence, the swing is the essence, boats is the essence, teamwork and empowerment, keep them coming. And for me, the essence of rowing is that there are no heroes in rowing and we get to conquer and control the balance and the power of a boat. So we're going to move into some questions uh, for the panelists. And uh, the very first question goes to USD. And Dave, I'm looking at you. Uh, for all of the times that I text coaches and programs around the country, who does a really good job of recruiting uh, for inclusivity besides Temple and some of the other universities, San Diego almost always, University of San Diego almost always come to the top of that. Uh, matter of fact, when I had my, when I was doing my tenure with US Rowing and I was at the um, San Diego cr Crew Classic, I can remember stopping the coach in the row like, who the hell are you? It, it was just such a, just very inclusive, look like America, uh, a rowing program. So uh, I'll give you the whole 45 minutes if you want, but tell us about your program. Uh, and you, can you give us a, a, an example of your recruiting strategy that doesn't have other rowing coaches steal from you? So whatever you can share strategy wise. Yeah, we're good. I'm, I'm not afraid of anybody stealing, stealing anything from us, you know, I think, um, if we can all work together to make, you know, to make this a more inclusive sport than everybody else. Um, I'll say first off, I think a lot of our success is I can attribute to our, our student athletes, like first and foremost, I mean, they are a, a really, really fantastic, unique group of individuals. And I think a lot of our efforts towards um, diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, we do them because they are the right thing to do. It makes our team better and faster. And a lot of it is, is being driven by the student athletes themselves. I mean, I try not to fan out about them too much when I'm about them, but um, I really am their, their biggest fan. I think when, when you hear Katie speak, you'll, uh, you will all become fans as well. Um, but I think we, we've kind of come at it with, from two angles, right? We look at what makes our team attractive to a diverse group of individuals and how do we go out and find those individuals. Those are the two challenges we're looking at. Um, and for us, the premise has been just really, really simple of when you come to our team, we want you to be your true self. On our program, you will never hear us talk about what a USD rower looks like, what they sound like, how they act, um, because a USD rower looks and acts and sounds exactly like what our rowers look and act and sound like. Um, so when we're recruiting people, we're asking them to come to our team to bring themselves to our team and build upon the culture that we already have. 
we're not asking people to come in here and fit into this, this mold that we've created, um, you know, in the sport of rowing, where the traditional sense of what a rower is, is based off of a very, very narrow group of individuals, typically straight, white, upper class uh, uh, individuals. So, you know, we have expectations on the team of always being a good teammate, always being respectful, always being accepting of, of one another, and always, always working hard, always working towards our team goals. Um, but within that, you be who you are, whether that's, you know, that's a sister, whether it is an artist, um, if you are Black, if you are white, if you are Asian, any of those things that you establish as your identifiers, bring that to our program. Um, and so with recruiting, we go out looking for individuals that have, you know, unique traits that we currently don't have on our team. And we look for people with really, really cool stories. Um, and so we're not looking for a square peg to go into a square hole. We're looking for a peg that's a shape that we didn't, we've never even seen before. Um, this, is a, this is a brand new shape to us. Um, and of course, you know, we are looking, we're a division one institution. So we are looking for people who can do all that and be fast at the same time. Um, and, you know, I, I, I can go on all day about this, but just to um, give you an example, we have uh, an incoming freshman. She, she's moving in next week. Um, who's a fantastic coxswain. Um, and we learned in the recruiting process that she was born in China and was separated from birth um, from her twin sister. And she moved to Sacramento and her twin sister was adopted to a small fish, uh, fishing village in Norway. And there's actually a documentary about her. If you wanna look it up, it's called Twin Sisters. Um, and when we, found, when we found that out, we said, hey, I can guarantee you there's nobody on our team who has a twin sister that they were separated from who's on the other side of the world who speaks a completely different language. That's a cool story. That's the person who we want on our team. Um, and there's tons. We have another girl who at the age of 14 wanted to row. Um, her school didn't have a rowing program. So she just established her own rowing program at her school. She was a founder. Um, and if she can do that at age 14, then I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to see what she can do at age 30. I mean, it's going to be pretty good. Um, and, you know, along the way, we've had a ton of, a ton of help. I think uh, Arshe is a, is a fantastic um, you know, advocate of our program. He helps definitely get the word out. Um, and, and webinars like this are great. Great. Thank you for that, Dave. A uh, couple of things that I heard. Intentionality. So when we are in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we need to be intentional. The other thing that I heard that you're not looking for a cultural fit, you're looking for a cultural add. What can those individual athletes add to your program? Third, thirdly, what I'm hearing is that you it was very clear that creating a more inclusive rowing program doesn't mean you're creating a slower rowing program. You're, it's not exclusive. It, it's, it, it is part of it. The, bit, the larger my athletic pool, the faster my boats are going to be. Uh, and then finally, what I really love hearing is that you have created uh, what we call psychological safety within the culture of your crew so that people can truly show up and identify how they want to identify uh, within that program. And a lot of programs believe that they have this safe space, but if you actually talk to the athletes, the athletes would say they don't get to show up to be themselves. They have to, they have to fit in a certain way. So thank you for that. So Katie, you know I'm popcorning right up to the right hand corner because uh, your name comes up just as often in this sport as your school name uh, shows up. And so I would love to just hear your perspective of what Dave said, um, feel free to debate him and tell him he's wrong because I'd like to see a good fight. Um, but uh, <laughs> I, I'd love to just hear your perspective and how you have been in this space. And I really love when I spoke with you the other day that you are, you are back and you're helping coach. And that's huge when we're creating a program is to show that representation in leadership and not just in the in the boat so it's your show yeah um you know what's interesting when dave was mentioning that they don't look for anybody that's like that fits a specific mold they just look for people to add to the team 
I don't think I ever realized that until he just said it because being on the team, I mean, they're just my teammates. Like everybody is so different. Everybody has such different interests. They're from all over the place. Like honestly, no two people are the exact same on our team. Um, and I never thought about that because that's just USD women's rowing. Like that's, I've been on the team for five years and that hasn't changed throughout all the coaching changes that we've had. Um, so that's something that's definitely been consistent with our team. Um, and like you said, like when you come to our team, when you look at us, we just look like a bunch of random people who happen to be on this team together because we don't look the same. We don't act the same. We don't think the same. We're all super, super unique, which I genuinely, genuinely appreciate. And I think for me, it never necessarily dawned on me because I've never been a part of another collegiate experience. This is my one and only. Um, and being a part of it just was so normal and natural to me. So I 100% with, I agree with everything he just said. Um, we're just looking for people who can add to our team standards and our morals and our speed. And if you can do that, it really doesn't matter the rest. It, that's just what we're looking for. Um, so I, I completely agree. And I think like you were mentioning with uh, representation with me helping out coaching, I, it's very, it's funny because when I told the coaches that I still wanted to do it, they were all very um, enthusiastic about me continuing to be part of the team. And I think that they kept me on for a reason. I think that I add something unique to the team that they are looking for. And I think that it's going to be very beneficial being part of the coaching staff. Um, for example, I'm uh, studying to be a therapist. So I'm really, really big into mental health. And I think that that's my niche. That's something that I'm super passionate about that I can give to the rest of the team. Um, so that's just one example about how we all have our specific interests that kind of, when you put all together, we're just very uh, well-rounded. So I think that that's something that I'm excited to add for the team, as well as being a Black woman who's been involved for this, with the sport for so long. Um, so yeah, I think that we're all just unique individuals that somehow all fit together well. And um, I'm just really thankful that that's kind of the mindset that our coaching staff has, because if not, I don't think I would have met as many great people as I have being a part of USD. I know y'all like it when I'm on mute, but I'm now off mute. Uh, thank you for that, Katie. I appreciate that you're just learning about the intentionality of this cultural ad as well, which makes it even more authentic, right? And so the sincerity is that you didn't know that was happening on purpose. And so that's how authentic the program actually is. Um, one quick question for you. Um, how did you, did, were you recruited for uh, USD? Yeah, so um, started talking to coaches my senior year of high school didn't actually want to come to USD. It wasn't my, I just, I just wasn't really interested in the program. And then I came on an official and I was like, oh, this is, this is where I should be. Um, the entire coaching staff was completely different. Not one coach from my freshman year is here now. Um, but I think that what's really interesting with that is throughout the coaching staff changes, our intentionality has stayed consistent. Um, and I think, like you said, like I, I'm like genuinely did not know that that was kind of the way that our coaches recruiting because I was just an athlete who just got new team members every year like I didn't know how they got there I just they just came and it was it was what it was um but hearing Dave say that and the fact that he's been such a great recruiter I'm like oh that makes a lot more sense why like hearing from the coach's perspective like that makes a lot more sense how things happened and how they ended up to be what they are um so yeah 100 percent authentic did not know that that was part of it but it makes a lot more sense hearing it now thank you for that so we have a uh just a response in the question and answer. Recruiting is only a small piece. I think having people feel safe and comfortable once they are there is even more important. How do you create a culture where everyone feels safe, welcome, included as their true self? How do you shift its culture if the culture isn't there yet, or even worse, it's toxic in some way? And so I'm not gonna ask you to answer that right now, but we're gonna get back to that with the live question and answers. Cause I, I think again, creating a psychologically safe environment is really important. And we might actually begin to hear how that happens from some of the other panelists. So thank you for that question or announcement. So I'm gonna move to my, okay. I, if I had to pick my favorite child from Pittsburgh, would it be CMU or RMU? 
Um, since I'm a part-time professor at Robert Morris, I want to keep a job. I'll just say RMU for, for that reason, for job security reasons. Um, and so, Carl, I met your crew when I was still the inclusion manager of U.S. Rowing, so that's a long time. And I was blown away by the fact that your crew way back then was already creating an internal DEI committee within the athletes. Can you speak to that about your program? I think we have an interesting setup and it has changed and will probably continue to change as we reevaluate what works and what doesn't work because we all know this is a lifelong process. Um, this year we have a leadership team and one of my, let me back step. I very much view my leadership position on the team as one of inclusive leadership. So I like the distributive leadership model a lot. It's not my team, it's my athletes team. And I'm there to support them and make sure they get what they want out of their four years in college and that experience. So this year when we sat down to figure out how we were going to distribute a little bit more power, so to say, or leadership roles amongst the team, we put together a leadership team with different chairs. And within that, there is a social justice chair. So we've had, I have a teaching background, I have an education background, I have a doctorate in education. So I, I look at everything through lesson plans and like long-term development pieces. And we've had a longstanding cultural humility curriculum that we have included into our team for a really long time. This year, the social justice chair, along with Amalia, who's actually in charge of diversity, equity, inclusion for all of athletics. She is the DEI rep for the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. Um, the athletes created the curriculum this year. And so we adapted from last year and wrote the curriculum together this year and have been a little bit more intentional about what we want to see in terms of end goals. And a lot of it has to do with skills like communication and identity formation being huge because it occurred to me last year, and Molly, I'd love your opinion on this, that we had a lot of, just speaking strictly from race, we had a lot of white athletes on our team who are terrified of thinking about their own identity because they didn't know what it was. So I think we're taking a huge step back this year to really get to know ourselves and our why, our story of self, and then focus on that intersectionality piece to see how our identities intersect since we're all rowers on Robert Morris's team. Um, within that, we're switching to affinity groups too for some of our discussions. Um, Amalia in particular is developing curriculum for our athletes of color. Along with, I'm gonna give her a shout out, I know she's not here, with Wanjiru, who's been, who is our social justice chair on our team. She's incredible. So the two of them are really taking that lead because we have enough critical mass on our team now that 10 rowers of color need their own space away from their white rowers of color to have discussions because our needs are different. So I think that's where we are right now. It's been very intentional. I'll let you know if this new approach works at the end of the year where we evaluate it. And I kind of want to kick it over to Amalia to talk about what she's been doing too, because she has a bigger picture within the whole athletic department, just not within our team. And, and so before you go off mic, Amalia, uh, Carol, what, what I think is important to what you are saying, and someone asked this question about USD, is about how do you, if you keep having, if you have turnover of coaches, how do you keep that culture? Well, the athletes own it, not the coaches. And, and that's where it begins. I also want to applaud RMU because you called me in to make sure that we have annual diversity, equity, inclusion training. We spent a half a day together with, a, with all of the athletes. And then the, the one of the things that's super important for every person on here that's a rower is that Robert Morris became the leader in the DE&I space for all athletics. Uh, the rowing program became the leadership for all athletics, the entire campus where we had every single athlete for the first time ever with athletic directors in one room listening to me ramble on and on and on and some other people but that's that's how you you can't keep d e and i just close to your chest you have to invite others to also be in that space so amalia uh following up with carol uh you you have been through the pitfalls of creating the, the program. Uh, so none of this is gonna be smooth, right? So go ahead and tell your truth. 
Um, so I think that um, similar to USD, we don't have uh, a cut mold that we want any of the people that are recruited to fit. Um, I've realized that like from after being recruited, uh, like Katie, like um, as I am more hands on with recruiting, like I'm just looking uh, for people to add to the culture of our team. Will they buy into the culture? Will they uh, further our team and what do what they add as well? Um, however, I feel as though we're still working on that. We're like fitting as a puzzle piece. And so uh, what I encourage the women of color on my team to do is take up the space that we were told that we're not supposed to take up. Uh, it's like like reflecting back in high school, you look um, and you, you remember like the looks you got at regattas and why does no one look at me? And I remember even seeing a boat uh, named culture shock but it was full of like white women um and so it's like when you look back on those things you want to see how you want your team to be different and elevated from what you experienced in high school and so we really encourage taking up space and creating um things for ourselves to support ourselves and so it's very um it's become a family at this point that we bring others into our team into to learn more about us and better understand us so we can have a better community on our team. Thank you for that, Amalia. Um, so I'm gonna move on to Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, I think Kaylin, you're gonna be the first person. Um, so I adopted your program. Um, I was born into RMU's program, but I adopted CMU's uh, program because they, when the DEI committee for U.S. Rowing was formed, they watched the webinar and they realized that with self-reflection that they could do better in the space of being anti-racist. And so we got together and we talked and they formed uh, 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 their own DEI committee. Uh, I think the committee was already in action, but we even went through uh, anti-racism training as, as an entire program which is, uh, as, as I tell to all of the uh, participants, make sure that before you invite people that are different than you into your home, that you are prepared to have people that are different than you in your home. And so, Kaylin, tell uh, us about how you are using rowing to actually connect to the communities in the city of Pittsburgh uh, that traditionally would never even look at CMU as a college. Yeah, so uh, uh, first, like off your point, like fixing your culture before you can recruit, there's like a couple of things, a lot of people are talking about recruitment, but CMU is just like a club team. We don't recruit very much, but we recruit within our own campus space. We don't just don't go off campus to recruit. So like thinking about increasing our diversity, like looking at our campus, it, we see that our campus isn't very diverse when you look at it. So we needed to look like outside of our campus in order to try to increase the diversity and while we're working on making our culture better within our team. So we, have in conversation with Richard and hearing a lot of the webinars US Rowing was having, uh, we realized we needed to, the best way to increase uh, open up the Pittsburgh community and CMU's campus as a whole, not just growing, uh, is to reach out to the Pittsburgh community. And so we started trying to form an outreach program that stemmed from CMU's rowing team and kind of expanded to like the campus as a whole. So Richard is like a huge influencer in us getting this up and running, but he told us about a program out of MIT called Amphib Amphibious Achievements, which combines rowing, swimming, academics, and mentorship into one program, which we thought for CMU would be like a perfect fit because I mean, we love rowing. The whole starting point of this was the rowing. And the more you learn about why rowing is a barrier, the swim and swim comfortability is like up there. So uh, having a program that combined water safety skills and swimming, that seemed great. And CMU's other core is academics and to really connect with their community, having a mentorship component is huge so that outside of rowing and outside of program hours, you can really maintain that connection with your community. So those four pillows, pillars seemed like amazing. So since about like a, 
year ago, we had got that idea and we've been trying to like build this outreach program. Um, and pretty much the building of the outreach program was like a lot of communicating with partners within the Pittsburgh community, talking to Richard, talking to community centers, talking to the Rivers Rowing Association, which is a big boathouse that we row out of in Pittsburgh. And uh, yeah, it's still in development right now. We, the most recent update with our program is that we're partnering with the Rivers and their outreach program. So we can really bring the Pittsburgh community together. So yeah, I think that's uh, the biggest thing that we're doing to really connect CMU's rowing team with the Pittsburgh community. Yeah, thank you for that, Kaylin. So Carnegie Mellon University had a, a had a really they stepped in it in so many ways with the community of Pittsburgh, and and the, and so the Carnegie Mellon's club rowing decided that we're going to help our university actually connect with the city of Pittsburgh, and in those communities that are traditionally not part of rowing programs, and um, that takes a lot of soul searching as well. Um, and I, I think the, the reason why I wanted uh, our a CMU on here is because sometimes rowing programs say, well, I, our campus is just not, we don't, we don't have that much diversity on our campus, but I bet you have that in your community. And so maybe you don't have a rowing program, uh, maybe you're not able to recruit and, and I, uh, I'm, I could say a lot about that. Maybe you do have a challenge with recruiting athletes that may be different than you, but maybe you just partner with the community and use your resources to be that anti-racist, to do that social uh, injustice. And that's how uh, CMU is approaching this. They're not looking to create the world's fastest rowers. They're looking to connect uh, community members to the sport of rowing who normally would not be connected to the sport of rowing. Hugh, do you want to uh, piggyback on what Kaylin said? Yeah, um, to, to build on Kaylin and what you were talking about, Richard, I think um, this is also something that like at, in the CMU community, we've seen generally, even with like our club sports program is just like a general almost apathy towards like trying to connect our like CMU programs with the community. And like, we really felt like as a, as like a rowing team that like we had the resources and the opportunity to really reach out and like develop our community. And also like um, uh, within, within our, our own team, at least um, expand this opportunity so that we can create a more a diverse rowing community, at least in Pittsburgh. Um, and so with this development um, and talking with uh, uh, community centers and community leaders, um, I feel at least um, program building wise, we've, we've come quite a bit and we're almost ready um, to get going. Um, but still internally uh, with our team and at least within our school, um, we're still working really hard in trying to make sure that we are we are practicing anti-racism and like really trying to make sure that at the very least our team members within the CMU Rowing Club um, becomes that um, active member in the community in expanding this opportunity uh, to Pittsburgh. Thank you, Hugh. And, and so overarching with all of these programs, it began internally first, soul searching, training, being culturally aware, being racially literate, and really understanding your cultural humility. And from there, you can begin to have that uh, ability to, if you recruit, have that ability to go to a high school or, or to meet an athlete where they are, and, and they can smell that you are for real. And so that's the overarching. I want to shift into another discussion, and then we're going to open it up uh, for the rest of this evening, this evening here in Pittsburgh, and at four o'clock in San Diego, or is it 4.30 in San Diego? Something weird. <laughs> I can't stand time zones, I'm just saying. Uh, and so the Paralympics is coming at us. The rowing is about to be on the tube on Tuesday. And it will run, the rowing, Paralympic rowing will run all the way through Sunday. 
And I, I'm really curious with NCAA in particular, and there's no one representing NCAA per se, um, but what efforts, programs, thoughts have your rowing programs had about adaptive rowing, uh, pipelines for Paralympics, uh, recruiting uh, athletes uh, with, with dial, that's dial divergent? Can anyone speak to that? Or want to? I can start the conversation. I mean, I think that I think the quick answer on my part is that it's it's not a conversation that has come up a ton. I mean, I don't. There are there are very if there are, forgive my ignorance. If there are races at the at the NCAA level that are, you know, para events, or you know, adaptive events, I don't I don't necessarily see them. So I don't think our inclination is to train for those specific events. I think the most experience that we or I've had coming from just again pulling the teacher card is you know learning how to reach a group of diverse learners, which as you, you brought up before we started this, Richard, like ADHD being a huge thing, anxiety, you know, the, all of those pieces that we take into account. So trauma-informed coaching sessions have been really, really helpful, but also how do you alter a training program to make sure that everyone can stay, every, it is accessible to everyone. So I know US Rowing talks a lot about long-term athlete development. That means meeting athletes where they are, not only from like a physicality standpoint, but also if you have an athlete who has a trouble staying focused for a two hour long steady state piece, how are you gonna split that up so that they can still get that workout in, but it's easier for them to stay engaged and actively engaged the entire time. So I think you, a lot of it comes from like a lot of self-reflection too with your athletes and that back and forth of like, what do you need to be successful? How can we continue to adapt this? So that's just to start the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Carl. And, and as you were saying that, I was thinking about how invisible disabilities are also federally protected. It's a protected class. And you may not know that you have athletes with invisible disabilities on your team. And so are you creating a culture of inclusivity or are you, or do you have non-inclusive language that actually does not, uh, will actually will end up with no retention of those athletes. Anyone else have a thought about that? And it's, and it's okay that you haven't thought about it, but what are your thoughts about not having thought about it? I mean, I can say a little bit. Um, I definitely like in creating our DEI committee and thinking more about inclusion on our team, it's come into conversation, but the focus has definitely been uh, like black or black people of color. And I most recently in the past summer, I've been volunteering with the adaptive team at the Rivers Rowing Association and working closer with adaptive athletes has definitely taught me a lot about para rowing and that there's definitely a capacity for teams to incorporate it. I think like a lot of times people think like maybe we don't have the equipment, like adaptive singles or doubles a lot of teams don't naturally have but adaptive athletes also row in standard fours they can row in boats you already have in your boathouse uh, I think when you're talking about competitive teams like for city athletics I haven't even thought about like what that there might not be para events for your team or your league whatever but I mean especially coming from a club team we've talked about having sectors more competitive sectors than uh, other sectors of the team and just because a big thing with our team is that a lot of people thought I guess I'm getting more into our initiatives at figuring out why people why we can retain certain athletes and a big thing was we expected a high level of athleticism going into the team and so we've been trying to think about how we can transform our novice program to retain more people that maybe aren't at the optimal athleticism at novice year run five miles immediately that's just like unreasonable. We're not, that's not a good thing. So we're talking about transforming our novice program. And that's definitely something that I think we can talk about as coaches next year, that there hundred percent is a capacity to take on adaptive athletes with the equipment we have. And it's just, you've got to be open to it. Like 
like you mentioned, like there might be some language that's not, uh, that might not be inclusive for adaptive athletes. Like I feel like working more with adaptive athletes, I've like picked that up also. You just gotta think about certain content calls, certain things that you've never thought about until you start working with adaptive athletes, but they're hundred percent so capacity to, for teams to incorporate it into their program. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Uh, there, um, I was just thinking that the beauty of rowing is that I don't need to use my eyes to row, right? But how many of us are recruiting visually impaired and people who may identify as blind? We just, there's just a, in, increase your athletic pool, I guess is what the bottom line is there. Um, so I'm not gonna call out NCAA or anyone else today. I always call people in, I raise them up and I help them grow. And so I wanna move, I don't wanna move from this topic. Maybe there's some participants that wanna continue this conversation. And so we can, it'll be uncomfortable. Anytime that we're talking about inclusivity, it's gonna be awkward, we're gonna be uncomfortable and just that's it, deal with it because that's what being in this space is all about. And so I like to open, I would like for people to go into chat and say that you want to come off mic and speak and Sam from US Rowing will let me know who would like to speak and ask a question. Uh, but as we work on that, I'm gonna read some of the questions to the panelists. Uh, here's a question. Uh, how does USD carry continuous intentional purpose through change on coaching? And we sort of touched on that earlier. So either Katie or Dave, you decide, arm wrestle, go. I guess I'll, I'll go first, but um, Katie should probably be the one because she's actually been at the school longer than I have. But um, I, I, I think we, you know, you, you touched on it earlier is just through the athletes. I think our athletes have decided that, you know, this is a, a um, you know, a huge area of importance for them. And so they carry it through different coaching changes. And I think the school itself does a really good job of having a culture of care about, around our students. Um, I think that they, they can and are always trying to do better. Um, I, by no means do I think it's perfect, but I think the students who come to USD um, are given a fair amount of individual attention from the professors, from their coaches, from their, their mentors while they're here. And that has kind of evolved into this, into this culture that carries through several different coaches. But um, yeah, you might have you might have more insight than I do. Yeah, on, like that's pretty much it. I think I think that it was an unspoken thing amongst the athletes, but we kind of knew from like through multiple years of recruiting kind of what we wanted our team to be. And I think that we represented that in ourselves and kind of voiced that to the coaches, um, whether we knew it or not. Um, so I think we definitely, I think we definitely carried it through. I mean, I went through three head coaches in my years at USD. And I think that just through us athletes, we created this dynamic, we created this team, we created this environment um, within ourselves. And I think that the coaches kind of, um, understood that as they continue with our team. And I think they kind of picked up on that and then they reflected that with us. So I think it was just kind of the energy that we brought to the coaches whenever they did come through and then they picked up on it and continued that throughout their time coaching. Thank, thank you, Katie. Um, I, I had another question about that. Oh, so uh, Amalia, um, as an athlete, senior athlete, and um, if you can speak to this, uh, a person asked, well, how, I'll use the term psychological safety, uh, asked, how do you create that safety? What are the things that are necessary for people to show up and actually identify as who they are and not have to assimilate to become a cultural fit versus a cultural ad. Right, so I think a common thing that we can see in rowing now is that a lot of people want to recruit for diversity, but they don't provide um, the resources and really tend to those athletes of color. So at Robert Morris, um, like whenever I am recruiting or helping recruit a woman of color onto our team, I'm very like transparent about what campus culture is like, um, like my own personal experience 
campus um, and like other resources that they can have on campus. Also using myself and other women of color on our team as resources. Um, like I said previously, we're now like this little family within our big family, um, that's our team. And so it's really important to ensure and continuously follow up with those uh, athletes of color and ensuring that they are psychologically sound and that they have the resources they need and familiar, uh, familiarity, uh, so to speak. It's very hard to be the only on your team. You talk about that a lot, Richard, being the only person uh, that looks like you on your team or only having like one other person. And so it's very important that like you provide and ensure that they have those resources and that they don't necessarily feel alone because not only are they being recruited onto a team, uh, if they are like division one or anything, but they are also uh, experiencing an incredible life change of like being in a place that they don't really know. And so you have to take that, uh, the athlete as a whole and support them as a whole individual and not just as a rower, I believe is like the best way to ensure that. So like using campus resources and also including those resources uh, within your team, like on my team, we did the affinity groups. And so now since we've done like an affinity group with all women of color, we uh, have made plans to like have an early move in program for our freshmen of color. Um, so they already have that set foundation of people they can lean on uh, prior to meeting a bunch of like 40 other girls that don't necessarily look like them or really understand where they come from. Thank you, Amalia. Uh, any other panelists, uh, psychological safety, creating that space, uh, creating that culture, any thoughts on that? I think what I learned very early on is that none of us can guarantee that a, a, an area is safe or a team is safe. So I, I don't promise safety because I can't guarantee safety. And you know I can't promise that our culture is perfect because I can't guarantee that. So I think that openness and that vulnerability and that transparency on our end is also really, really important. We can continue to learn and we can continue to try, but I will never promise that our team is gonna be perfectly safe for anybody. Cause I don't know if it is. Right. Cause right. I don't know a lot. Right. Uh, can I piggyback off Carol really quick? Well, of course. I I think another thing that's very important is like Carol is super transparent uh, with what she just said. And she's like, I will disappoint you. And like, she's not perfect, even though she is like so far along her journey of allyship, she still isn't like, there's no such thing as the perfect ally. And so I think like letting, if you are like a coach, letting your um, athletes uh, have the opportunity and like ability to correct you like I often pride the fact like I take a lot of pride in the fact that I can call Carol out and debate her or disagree with her um, and like just genuinely have a heart to heart with her about what is and isn't working for like women of color on our team and just have knowing that she will actually listen and reevaluate our whole uh, curriculum if need be just for us to have that safe environment um, is really important. Thank you. I, I, oh, Katie, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add on something Amalia said, and I think because it made me reflect. So my freshman year when I was being recruited, um, I didn't know anybody but my team. Um, my coach didn't introduce me any of the resources, any like black resources, any people of color, like literally nothing. I just was recruited. This is USD Women's Rowing. This is like your, this is who you're going to hang out with. Um, and I was one of two black girls on my team. And I think the team was probably like 30, 40 ish. And I think that a lot of coaches don't understand how far it goes for you to introduce your athletes to other people that look like them that may not be on the team. Um, because for me, I know it's like, okay, well, this is women's rowing and this is kind of all I have. And it's literally only my people on the team. So I feel that I'm just kind of I just have to stay with these people and I can't figure anything else out for myself because it, it just gave off, like they gave off the impression that the women's rowing team is who you have to be with. Um, so I think like Amalia said, just introducing a lot of other resources that may not, that's maybe outside of athletics, just kind of helping your athletes become more well-rounded to understand that they have other identities besides just being a student athlete or just being a rower. Um, there are a lot of different resources on campus that can provide 
a lot of help and information that um, your team may not be able to. And that's just something to work on, but it's also something to accept and acknowledge. And um, in the meantime, until you are able to help your athletes, re like refer them to someone who can help them in that meantime. Um, so I think definitely creating a list of resources to give your athletes based on their identities is something huge because it there's more than just your team out there. Like they have to connect with other people as well. So I think that was just a huge thing that I wanted to emphasize what um, Amalia said. No, that, that, that's a great tip, Katie. Uh, so if, if the participants are thinking about tips on, on at least going towards having uh, psychological safety within the team is that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And so sometimes you have to, as a coach, as a rowing program, you have to make sure and ensure that you have artifacts and resources specifically uh, to meet your athletes where they are. And so it may be connecting them to the cultural center. It might be connecting them to a uh, BIPOC mentorship program. Uh, if you want sustainability, you want retention. Sometimes you're just, you just don't have the resources as a team but you can, you can actually provide those resources on your campus. Any other thoughts on that track? And we'll go to another question. Humming along here. All right, so here's a statement, maybe pronouncement. Let's see how we address it. Rowing is unusual that most people don't grow up playing it in their backyard like soccer or Little League. If you didn't grow up in a rowing city, you re rarely have the experience with the sport and probably have a certain image of a rower in your head, tall, white, prep school type. How do you help people see themselves as a possible rower if they don't see themselves in the sport? And that's a great question because just on a national level, rowing is one of the oldest sports. It's one, it, it is an original Olympic sport. That's how old it is. But it's also a foreign sport on our own land. And so who would like to tackle that pronouncement? Amalia, hands up. Yes. Um, so I, like before I like met a boy in high school that rode out of PCR living literally so close to Boathouse Row. Growing. Yeah, in Philadelphia uh, with Boathouse Row. I had no idea like what rowing was. It was like the same can uh same questions we all get like is it canoeing is it kayaking is it paddle boarding right um but what I've learned um and actually what Carol inspired me to do as a collegiate athlete is to teach learn to row not only did it like help me be a better rower um and and like helped me educate myself more about the sport, but it also helped me connect my roots back to my old team, Philadelphia City Rowing. And so whenever I see uh, young black girls that come to this camp and like perform insanely well, or not even if, even if they don't perform insanely well and they're just having fun, I encourage them to row. I'm like, you, I'm like, we need you. Like I always say, rowing always needs more women of color. And so I'm like, if you had at least a little fun, like consider furthering your rowing career far beyond middle school rowing or like learn to row. Cause usually that's how young people are at these camps and stuff. So like really just genuinely talking to kids who wouldn't necessarily be recruited for rowing elsewise, you know, is really important in building uh, those connections with um, inner city communities where there are more minority groups and introducing them to this sport that is like completely foreign to them, but that they can thrive um, in as well as the typical uh, rower. Thank you. Kaylin, you, you've been quiet. Thoughts? And so Go ahead, Carl. I was gonna I was gonna pull Kaylin and Hugh in. I was like, you talked a lot about you know being in the community. So I think the the wider your your spread is and the more you're introducing it, the younger you're hitting them, right? Then you're then the youth get to define what a rower looks like then as you move forward. And I think that's why it's really cool, this long-term development piece. I mean, I think sometimes we miss out at the college level because you pull someone in for four years. So you get them, which is fantastic. I love novice rowing. I love novice rowing. And I think it's it's easier now, like Amalia said too, like representation matters. So 
on our campus, when Amalia is out there with me recruiting novices on campus, their typical rower looks like Amalia. So then you have more and more, it looks, it's, it's an environment that automatically exudes that like I would fit in here. But if you start it earlier and it's not a foreign concept when they hit college, then the perception of what a rower looks like changes. Yeah, and that's a great, that's actually could, could go down, Carl, as yet another tip for recruiting. Uh, Dave, as a, as a recruiter, as a head recruiter, you know, to have Katie on recruitment calls and, and for people that you may be recruiting that look like her, that's huge. Ha having Amalia and Katie and, 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 and you and, uh, you know, who are you trying to recruit? Introduce them to representation. And so we, there's a lot of tips uh, and I'm going to call in my NCAA programs. And if you want to be involved with para or adaptive, and, and even if you don't do it a, a, as competitive as, as you're with your team, but you want to connect with communities, uh, people are mentioning Tara's program, uh, Seize the Oar, um, as well as I would recommend uh, Athletes Without Limits, uh, breaking barriers out of Delaware. There, there are lots of actual club programs that really target um, uh, very intentional with with who they want to um, want to row with them. Um, I, I want to, as we come into a close at seven fifty eight, I wanted to take a moment and and say that Nelson Mandela said one of the most difficult things in the world to change it, it wait, I'm sorry one of the most difficult things is not to change society but it's to change ourselves and so as we've learned, been going through this conversation today it really begins with where do you sit in this space of inclusivity what do you need to learn about yourself before you invite others in with open arms and so I want to thank my panelists you were amazing. You are the world changers, participants. Because you were on this call, I know you're about to become a world changer. And I, I want to let you know that we are here as a resource. The DEI Committee for U.S. Rowing is just the most inclusive rowing program, uh, inclusive committee uh, representing all that is U.S. rowing. Uh, use me as a resource. Uh, you will get a recording. There will be a recording of this. There's some tips in the chat. I believe Sam might send the scripts from the chat room. Uh, let's just send our panelists off with love. You all matter. Thank you very much for being on this panel. I hope you walk away with at least one nugget. Love you all. See ya.